Tomorrow, the nation will mark the birth of civil rights icon Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And today, we take a look at the changing face of the movement and the work by a local institution as it continues to preserve the past. Thank you all for joining us from college campuses to city halls. New voices in a movement for civil rights here in America, and some of it harkens back to efforts six decades ago, forever linked to a man who would have been 87 years old this year, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream. He was one of thousands fighting for the civil rights of Americans, but he will forever be the face of the movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would have been 87 years old this year. His lessons of equality and nonviolence and justice for all live on. In the same vein as his Southern Christian Leadership Conference upon its creation nearly 60 years ago. In 2015, African American students at Towson University reached an agreement with the school's interim president for diversity on campus and better race relations galvanized together peacefully. In Missouri, a diverse crowd demanded answers in how the university responded to reports of racism on campus there. It nearly drew the school's football team off the field prior to the university system's president stepping down. And here in Baltimore, groups, civic, religious, and community-based counter-rioting with peaceful protests and programs working to rebuild their community after rioting in April. The words of his dream, captured in grainy black and white, are set in our minds and in stone in Washington, D.C., out of the mountain of despair, a stone of hope, a hope for equality defined by character, not color, ensuring liberty and justice for all. Now, that sentiment has been part of the NAACP's mission since it was founded back in 1909, and as that organization worked to secure civil rights for African Americans in the 50s and 60s, the last name of Mitchell played prominently. Clarence Mitchell Jr. served as chief lobbyist, and his family's legacy can be seen across the state and right here in this building through his grandson, Clarence Mitchell IV, or C4. Talk to me about when you when you drive past Morgan or College Park or the courthouse downtown and you're thinking civil rights and the Mitchell name pops up. What goes through your mind? A legacy of fighting for not just the rights of African Americans, but the rights of all Americans. One of the things that my great grandmother, Dr. Lily Mae Jackson, who was president of the Baltimore branch of NAACP from 1935 to 1970 said was, the NAACP was created mostly by white people. So when you think about what the fight for civil rights has been about, it's not just been for African Americans, it's been for the rights of all, it is making the Constitution something that benefits all, which is why today, because of my grandfather, Clarence Mitchell Jr., you mentioned the names on some of the buildings. He was the 101st senator. That's a name given to him by the United States Senate. You know, there are only 100 United States senators, but they granted him that honorary title of 101st senator because of the impact that he made lobbying the uh, Congress, not just the Senate, but the House as well. And what he was doing, he carried a constitution with him everywhere he went. And what he said was, is that this document that was written back in the 1700s must apply to all Americans. So when we think of civil rights, most people think it helped African Americans. It helped everybody because it guaranteed that no one's rights would be violated. So you ask me what I think about. I think about the fact that my family helped to make a better America through all of what I just described to you. I won't try to age you, but at one point you were the young voice. Now there are a lot more young voices out there. <laughs> yes, the gray hair and the baldness shows, Jason. Yes, yes. But, but you have ushered in a new generation, I'd like to say, now as you look in the streets of Baltimore. Yeah. And when you see those 20-somethings, which I'm far away from as well. That's okay. What do you think of the new voices now? I love it. One of the things that we must allow for, Jason, because we, we look at my grandfather and, and uh, my dad even as a, a young civil rights leader. My father, uh, former Senator Clarence Mitchell III, was one of the founders of SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. It was uh, Dr. Martin Luther King and uh, Marion Barry and Julian Bond and all of them. They were involved. They were 20, 21, 22. The young voices are needed, not because they're right all the time, because they're not right all the time. They're needed because they care, because they have a passion, because they want to see a better Baltimore, a better Maryland, a better country. So even in their mistakes, and I've talked about it on radio show, I've talked about some of the mistakes, their mistakes still are from a passion place. They're not from a, a, a hateful place or some place of trying to be uh, difficult. So you ask me how I feel. I love the fact that we're seeing a very passionate young generation wanting to see change. How's the movement different now in 2016 versus 50s and 60s when your grandfather was really writing out the groundwork for all this? Well, they have a foundation. I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, there was no foundation. We were still in the heights of Jim Crow. We were still in the heights of segregation. We were still in the heights of so many walls that were legal. 
you, these weren't just like theoretical things. The law was in place to block African Americans, women, and in some cases other minorities, from participating in the American fabric. These young people actually have a foundation to build on. Now the civil rights movement took us to this point. Where young people need to take us to the next point is economic development, education, the things that now Brown versus Board of Education might have removed segregation education, but it didn't guarantee quality education. What we're missing, Jason, in many cities across the country, urban areas, is a quality education. And so that business development, being an entrepreneur, these are the places I see this generation taking that next level, taking I, the next step. I brought this issue up at a meeting once and someone said to me, oh, young people right now, they, they don't know tough times. They don't, they don't know such times, so how could they put any perspective together? What would your response have been? My response is the same I have when they talk about, well, you know, there are so many young African Americans, my, my children, 27, 23, and 19, they don't know uh, what it's like to be discriminated against. They don't, you know, they get along with everybody. Well, that's what the fight was about. The whole struggle was to guarantee that they would not know those things, but that they, they would look at white kids, Asian kids, Hispanic kids, and not see differences. That they would see everyone the same as what we see in many instances. So when people bring up that whole thing of, well, they don't know hard times, they weren't supposed to know hard times. They were supposed to have the foundation to take us from the this level to the next level. Now, they need, they need to be reminded about hard times, <laughs> but no, it's not, they don't necessarily, it's like almost being a fraternity, where you want to take that other young group through the line of hell you went through. No, you don't have to do that. One you don't last, have to do that. One last one. Sure. If your father or grandfather looked today and saw what America looked like, what would their impression be? They would be pleased with the progress that's been made, but they would be disappointed with the fact that uh, so many times we forget, we really do, Jason, we forget the fact that I would not be at WBAL without the show. You wouldn't be where you are without some of the sacrifices and some of the uh, pain, death, that got us to this point. We can never, ever allow the children, young people, to forget how they got where they are. Take it to the next step, but don't ever forget the history that brought us to where we are. We're not talking 200 years ago. We're talking 50, 60 years ago. So I think that they would be happy with where we are, but they would want young people to appreciate where we've come from. And thanks to C4 there. Now, the discussion of civil rights has gotten louder in recent months, particularly following the death of Freddie Gray here in Baltimore. And to his credit, Commissioner Kevin Davis and the Baltimore City Police Department are working to rebuild that relationship with the public, but parents of African American teens tell 11 TV Hills Lisa Robinson that teachable lessons remain for their sons in particular. I'm scared. I'm scared. Like many mothers of young black men, Tanil Gilliam says she's afraid for her son every day. That concern comes on the heels of police confrontations with young black men like Michael Brown, Eric Garner, and here in Baltimore, Freddie Gray. The wrong assumption being made, not knowing the person and just assuming from what you see of how the situation can go. My concerns are my son leaving out of the house and being pointed out because of his color or race. It's just a worry that you have raising a black male. Gilliam's 13-year-old son, Keenan Ray, says he worries about his safety every day. When I'm around police, I don't, you don't feel as safe because you think, you think they, they might think that you're doing something wrong and then you, you wind up losing your life just like some of the other black men. These parents are trying to make sure their sons stay on the right path. Playing football for the Baltimore Terps after school and on the weekends puts them in a positive environment. Many of these kids are being raised by single mothers, so Coach Dorian Gray spends a lot of time talking with them about things they will face in the world. You tell them what's right to do, what's wrong to do. Don't give the police a reason to do anything to you. Don't give the police a reason to um, pull out a weapon. Our society perceives them just because of who they are as a threat. Goucher professor and author of Stand Your Ground, Black Bodies and the Justice of God, Kelly Brown Douglas, is herself the mother of a young black man. She says black parents everywhere are having the talk with their children. I've always said to my son that if ever you are stopped by the police, even when you know that you have done nothing wrong, I've told him to do whatever they tell him to do, to get on his knees if they tell him to do so. And I've said to him because a moment's worth of humiliation can save your life. And when you look at the statistics, I mean, it, it, it is alarming that 
blacks, when they're stopped by the police, are three times as likely to be involved in an excessive use of force situation as whites when they're stopped. Law professor F. Michael Higginbotham is the author of The Ghosts of Jim Crow. He says the fact that some people don't feel safe when interacting with police is not a black problem, it's an American problem that needs to be addressed. We recognize it's a tough job but we also have to make sure that people feel safe and that bad officers or bad practices are changed. In recent months, Baltimore City Police have made efforts to improve relationships with young black men through sports. This summer, they organized a youth basketball league and in November, held the Unity Bowl game between police and young men. Lisa Robinson, WBAL, TV 11 News.